Hello class, this is Miss Augustine, and today we are going to start talking about Chapter 12, which is about the behavior of gases. So first of all, let's remember back in Chapter 10 when we first talked about kinetic molecular theory, and we talked specifically about how it um, how it uh, applies to gases. So we talked about the kinetic molecular theory, and we talked about the assumptions for the KMT, and the assumptions all have to do with a so-called ideal gas, which is one that completely conforms to these assumptions. And we said that with gases, um, all the particles have collisions that are elastic, so no energy is lost when the particles collide. The energy is proportional to the Kelvin temperature. Uh, the particles are in constant, random, rapid motion. There are no attractive or repulsive forces between the particles of an ideal gas, and their volume is set to zero. So there are a large number of particles relative to whatever space that you have. And then we talked about the fact that real gases, um, their particles actually do have a volume, so they occupy space. They do exert both attractive and repulsive forces um, on one another. And when we talk about the nature of gases in general, we know that gases are compressible because their particles are far apart. They um, display diffusion and actually effusion because their particles are moving so rapidly and randomly. They diffuse within a space. Um, they are fluid and they have relatively low density. And again, they can expand to fill a container. So then this is just an illustration that I love to use because it's showing you uh, for one mole of a solid, a liquid, or a gas, what the volume would look like. So for a gas, one mole of oxygen, for instance, occupies um, 22.4 liters or 22,400 milliliters. Um, if we were talking about one mole of aluminum, uh, which has a mass of 27 grams, it only occupies 10 milliliters. And we were talking, if we were talking about a liquid like water, one mole of water is 18 mils. So if you see 10 mils and 18 mils are pretty small compared to 22,000 mils. So the object of this slide is to show you that gases are far apart. So for an ideal gas, we said that the motion of the particles is random, linear, and that the collisions are elastic, meaning no energy is lost when the particles collide. And we said that real gases actually do attract and repulse one another. They do exert these forces. They do occupy space. So what do we need to do to define a gas? You need to know the volume in liters or milliliters. You need to know the pressure, and we'll talk about this in a few moments, but the pressure is generally expressed in atmospheres, kilopascals, or millimeters of mercury. You need to know the temperature, and it has to be expressed in Kelvin. And you need to know the number of molecules or moles, which we've learned about previously. So knowing these four things, you can completely define a gas. So we need to remember about the pressure of a gas. Where does that come from? Um, the pressure of a gas is caused by the collisions in a container. And it's evenly distributed because the particles of a gas are very random in their motion. And pressure is defined as force per unit area. So if you talk about pressure in terms of tire gauge for pressure, it's pounds per square inch, where pounds are a unit of force, and square inch would be area. So pressure is force per unit area. So the way we measure pressure is using a device called a barometer. This is a very early version of a barometer where there was a dish of mercury, which is a liquid at room temperature, and a vacuum tube was um, suspended upside down in it. And the atmospheric pressure pushing down on the surface changes the 
um, height of the column of mercury. So again, a barometer is a device that's used to measure pressure. It was developed by Evangelista Torricelli, and there's a picture of him. So when we're measuring pressure, again, you have a dish of a liquid. Um, typically, it's mercury, but you can also use alcohol for alcohol th um, barometers. And again, in terms of mercury, uh, the height of a column of mercury at sea level is 760 millimeters of mercury. And again, what's happening is the pressure of uh, the atmosphere is pushing down on the surface of the mercury, causing it to rise in the column. So the units of pressure that we typically um, use are the atmosphere, and its abbreviation is ATM. Uh, we use millimeters of mercury, and one ATM is equivalent to 760 millimeters of mercury. And one millimeter of mercury is also called a tor for Torricelli. And then the um, SI unit of pressure is the Pascal. One atmosphere is the same as 101,325 Pascals. So it is more convenient to use the unit kilopascals. So one ATM is 101.325 kilopascals. So I thought we would do um, two quick, or actually one quick, I lied, pressure conversion. Um, so here, if we were looking at a pressure conversion sheet that would look like this, and you're asked, for instance, how many atmospheres is the same as 1,500 millimeters, or how many tor are in 303.9 kilopascals. So I'm going to do one of these. How many atmospheres are 1,500 millimeters of mercury? So we would start with our given. This falls back on our ACE calculation method. Analyze, uh, calculate, evaluate. We would start with our given, 1,500 millimeters. Multiply by our conversion factor. We're going from millimeters to atmospheres. That means atmospheres has to be in the numerator. Millimeters of mercury is in the denominator. We cancel out millimeters of mercury, so we would put in our calculator 1500 divided by 760. That would give us this number. It has way too many significant digits. Notice up here the measurement we were given had two sig figs. Our second significant digit is the 9. The number immediately following it is a 7. So we would have to round up to 2.0 ATMs. So that is all for now. This is Ms. Augustine signing off.